I want to share with you a little story that kind of helps illuminate how these kids develop these testing skills or what I like to call survival skills. I'd like you to go on a little journey with me and imagine the following scenario. Imagine that our President of the United States has announced that they've discovered a, a terrorist element somewhere across the globe. And we need to send troops to root out these bad people. And they decide to draft all of you in this room. You're all drafted and you have to go to boot camp and learn how to fight and be a soldier because you're going to be shipped to this faraway country where this terrorist element is brewing. You're not happy about it, but you go. You go to boot camp, you learn all the things that soldiers need to learn about fighting, working well with a team, firing a weapon, and working as a, as a unit. And you get through boot camp, and they fly you to this remote country, and you report to commanding officer, and you say, we're here to report for duty, sir, and he says, good, we're glad you're here. Good thing, too, because we're losing a lot of good people. A lot of good troops are, are dying in this very worthy battle. So let me tell you what your life's going to be like for the next two years. For the next two years, you are going to get your gear on, and when night falls, we're going to march into the woods, into that jungle, because the terrorist groups are, are deeply embedded in, out there. We're going to march into there in a V formation, like a flock of geese fly. And I'm going to put you right at the very point of the V, because you're new. And when we're going to go into those woods when night falls, we're going to find the enemy. Eventually, as you get out there, you will encounter the enemy. When you do, you know, kill them, capture whoever you can, and then return. And you'll do this for the next, you know, 400 nights. Okay? Now, as you're doing that, um, just remember, there's booby traps out there. There's snipers. It's very dangerous. So you're going to have to be really, really careful. And listen, since you're at the point, Watch out, because we've lost a lot of good people. They, they get pinned behind, they get hurt, they get killed. So be very careful. So you're feeling kind of nervous about this instruction, so you raise your hand. You say, excuse me, commanding officer, could I ask a question? And the commanding officer says, sure, what, what, do, you, what do you want to ask? And he says, well, listen, I'm just new here. Could I be a little further back in the V until I get the swing of things, until I really understand this whole uh, thing? And the commanding officer says, absolutely not. We reserve the further back positions for soldiers that are within a few months of returning home. We wouldn't want somebody who's gone through a whole year and three quarters to get killed just before they go home. Okay, so be very careful. I really don't have time for questions because it's getting dark. Get your gear, get your rifle, get on a good pair of boots, and lead us in this formation out there tonight. So that you got the scenario? So now I want to ask you this. Would you agree with me that in order to increase your chances of survival, that you're going to probably have to change some of the ways you think, manage your feelings, and behave uh, from your civilian life and make some significant changes so that you could be more effective as a soldier? Would you agree with that? OK, so what I'd like to hear from you is, what are some of the ways that you think you should change the way you think manage your feelings? Like, what are some of the thoughts that you think are good thoughts to keep in your head? Like, I'll start you off with a bad thought, which would be my thought. Um, oh my God, I'm going to die. Now, that probably wouldn't necessarily be a good thought, because if you're continually saying, oh my God, I'm going to die, oh my God, I'm going to die, that you may not be as sharp as you need to be. I want to know, what do you think would be good things to say in your head that will help you maximize your survival? What do you think? Yeah. I'm going to have to kill people in order to survive. Okay, so since we're going to assume that you haven't killed people in civilian life, this is going to be a new thing. So let's stick with that. I'm going to have to kill people. Any thoughts about how you're going to be able to kill human beings effectively and quickly? Any thoughts about what you have to do to make that happen? Yeah. Uh, look at them more as objects or the enemy than individuals and humans. Yeah, dehumanize them. I mean, if you're thinking about them as, you know, somebody just like you with a mother and a father, it might, the empathy and the human compassion might get in the way. Because you need to be a survivor and you do need to kill. What other things would you say you have to change, either about the way you think or feel or act, that you think will help you survive? 
Yes. You have to shut off your emotions. Okay. Shut off your emotions. Would you recommend shutting all of your emotions off? Or would there be any that you would allow to come through? In that scenario, probably shut off as much as possible. What's the problem with letting yourself feel? How does that get in the way of your ability to be an effective soldier? You may question yourself and not act in a way that will help yourself survive. What do you all think of that? Does anybody want to add to that? Or does that sound, shutting off emotion, does that sound, does anybody have any other thoughts on that? Yeah. Channeling one emotion of anger. So you would let, you wouldn't necessarily shut down feelings of anger. Why would you let some anger come up? This would help propel me in, in rage and to go through with turning off these kinds of thoughts and things that would creep up that would make me not be a survivor, but maybe crumble in the moment. Right. So Not dehumanize them anymore. Anger would work well with the killing. Yes. Yeah, I would say anger would work like fuel and that I don't want to just survive. I want to... I want to be good. I want to be the best at this because uh, I think if I'm good at it um, or I'm the best at it, it would increase my chance of survival. And so that anger would sort of fuel my ability to find the enemy and kill them. I think you're making great points. One thought I want to put out there for your consideration is should you let the anger get to an excessive, explosive rage kind of point? Because I'm, wouldn't it, you want to keep your anger at a point where it still helps you use your skills. But if it gets blind rage, you might, I'm going to kill you all and run out there and get yourself into a bad So It's got to be some, somewhat under control. Okay, so what else? What do you think? Have we shutting off emotions? You have to kill people. You have to dehumanize people. Are we missing any key elements of how the big changes from civilian life with the way you think, feel, and act and this war life that you're going to have to make these adjustments to. What are some big adjustments? Yeah. I think you would be feeling a lot more fear than you would be feeling in your normal everyday life. You would have just a lot of fear inside, which might be helpful, but then taking that again too far it might be debilitating as well. So what do you do when the fear comes up to help it not become debilitating? Any thoughts? It's, good. it's a real tough thing, but... Well, let me ask you this question while we're, while we're on feelings. Should you get close to your fellow soldiers? I hear a no. 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 But these people got your back. These people you're living and dying with, you're not going to get close to them? Yeah. Yeah, because they could just get shot and killed in front of you. And if I was that close to someone, that, that might stop me from doing what I have to do. Yeah, while you're you know, mourning the person and feeling bad, you're exposed, you're not on guard. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's a good point. Let me throw this last scenario at you. You're walking at the head of the V, at the head of that V formation, and you look, it's a full moon, and you look off into the distance, and you see what looks like a young girl, maybe 14 or 15, of the enemy culture with a rifle. And your first thought in your head is, that could be my sister. Is that a good thought for you to have when it comes to your survival? No. What's a better thought? Well, who wants to tell me the thought that will be more likely to help you that you should probably have in your head when you see that? I'm pretty sure I can shoot her head off from you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to shoot her, or I'm going to shoot it, or whatever. I mean, throughout history of wars, we've come up with slang names for the enemy that help us dehumanize them. Okay, but you know what? Congratulations. You all made it. Two years of this warfare, two years of seeing things that have really affected you. You've come home to your neighborhood, you're back in civilian life, and it's been six months and you're having a hell of a time adjusting. You're having nightmares at night, you're, uh, you're using drugs, not prescribed drugs, you're using illicit drugs to assist you in managing some of these emotions. You've lost a job because you thought somebody was harassing you and you punched them in the face. So you have this aggression. Anybody have a diagnosis for me? What, what do you think it is? Post-traumatic stress. Very good. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Does anybody know what they called it in World War I? Shell shock. Shell shock. How about World War II? Battle fatigue. But in Vietnam, they began calling it post-traumatic stress disorder. So I see you walking down the street, and I'm across the street in a cafe, and I see you walking down the street, 
And this is what I see you doing. You're looking up at all the rooftops around you and all the windows. You seem very hypervigilant. And a car backfires making a loud noise and you dive behind some garbage cans. What do you initially think you're looking at? What is, huh? Snipers? Well, what do you, as the person across the street, looking at that person so hypervigilant, think you're seeing in that person? Someone who's crazy. Yeah, like a homeless person that's maybe a little crazy. But since you're a social worker, you decide to come across the street and approach this person and say, hey, man, you look like you've been going through a hard time. Um, and the person says, I have, and tells you all about their war experience and that two years of hellish experience and tells you about their job problems and their violence and their nightmares and their everything. And you say, listen, here's the deal, guy. You were in a war zone and you acquired survival skills to survive that war zone. But you're not in the war zone anymore, man. You're back home. And, and those skills that were great over here, they're really not working for you here. Look around. It's not a war. You're using skills from an old setting and bringing them to a new setting. You gotta cut it out or things are gonna go bad. Stop using those skills. They were good there. Good here, bad here. Are, is that argument gonna get you to drop those skills? Is it not a rational argument? Is it not true that those skills were good there but not good here? So why, why you, the veteran, why are you still using skills that are not appropriate for this new setting. Because those skills saved my life when I was in the military for two years. All right, but they're good. You could feel fond about them, but why use them in a non-military setting? I just don't think it would be that easy to put them away. I don't, I don't think it's easy to change those skills that, again, because it was life and death, I don't think it's that easy to just stop using them just because I'm in a different place. You like sports? Love sports. When you go to a football game, what do you do in the stands? Yell, scream. Can you be verbally abusive to the refs? Always. So you could yell, scream, and curse at the refs, and you get involved in this crazy, wild environment. But the next day when you're home, and let's say you go to church or synagogue, do you yell, hey, minister, you suck, you know? Do you use the skills from that football game over there? No. Do you recognize you're in a different setting? and you use different skills. So why can't you recognize the war setting is not the one you're in and use different skills? I, ju I just don't think it's as easy to put them away. Does anybody here have a theory on why people have a hard time putting away skills from a previous environment? What do you think? Fun behavior. But you learn to be wild at parties and then it's work you're not wild. You learn to be wild at football games but then the next day you're not wild. So what's the difference? Yeah. Is it because it's associated with the trauma? And isn't there a part of the brain that um, those memories are more intense because it's associated with the trauma so that they're very hard to get rid of? Absolutely. Skills acquired in a traumatic environment are hardwired into the brain. You learned in that environment that if you drop the skills, even, if you, even when you were in the war zone, when you were back at camp and you felt safe, if you drop the skills, something crazy could happen. We don't drop skills just because we flip environments. I think everybody knows where I'm going with this story. The kids we work with in residential facilities and some of the kids that are in our schools are living horrific lives, war zone lives in their homes. They develop survival skills. And what are some of those survival skills? Lying, stealing, aggression. So what do we do? We take their survival skills, we bring them into programs, we write treatment plans that say this violence, this survival skills got to go. We got to replace it. You know, this stealing and lying, it's got to go. If you told that veteran, you got to get rid of all those skills, they're bad, do you think they would get rid of them? They might even see you as the enemy trying to take away their survival skills. If we're going to be effective with troubled youth, we have to recognize and be very impressed with the array of survival skills and stop looking at them as behaviors that need to be eliminated. As a matter of fact, if you tell a kid from a traumatic environment what you're doing is bad, they might see you as somebody trying to rip away what has kept them alive. That's not the way to do it. 
the best way to engage a kid who's been through trauma is to recognize that the things that they're doing that disturb society and have had them placed in our programs are survival skills. And, in, and, and if we were going to design an environment to help them change, it has to have some key components. The first thing is the environment has to be able to manage their aggressive outbursts. It has to be able to do that. You can't let them come into your programs or your schools and turn your programs and schools into war zones, which they will. You have to create a sense of safety with them so that they feel comfortable putting down their survival skills. What I say to the youth I work with is, can you put your survival skills down briefly and just experience, we'll keep you safe, just put them down long enough for us to talk about other ways that you can maintain safety. But I never, ever tell kids, get rid of your survival skills forever.